everyone, this is Kalimara here, and no, it's not Calamari. Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new to the pond, go ahead and take a dive. You might like it here. So, Tears of the Kingdom is really popping off right now, as it should. In case you guys didn't know this about me, I am a huge fan of the Legend of Zelda games. I even have the poster for Breath of the Wild right here in my art room, and IRL too. And obviously a Tears of the Kingdom poster will be added to my collection soon enough. Call me a fake fan for having Breath of the Wild as my first Zelda game, but after falling completely head over heels for it, I've gone back and learned all about the past games and lore, so I don't just know about Breath of the Wild, okay? That's to say, I've waited eagerly for Tears of the Kingdom because it's one of the few Zelda games that are a direct sequel of a previous release, and Breath of the Wild has some of the most fleshed out characters in the series. So I'm very invested in the story. Unfortunately, due to being on that YouTube grind, I haven't been able to play it as much as I'd like to, and I ended up spoiling myself a lot just by virtue of being on Twitter and Tumblr and following the Legend of Zelda tag. Yes, I am on both hell sites, what of it? And of course, being on those two sites, I have become acutely aware of the controversy surrounding Sidon and a new character we meet in Zora's Domain. So if you haven't played the game and want absolutely no spoilers, click off now. I figured this would be a great opportunity to finally share some of my personal takes on these characters and how they relate to Link's story. And to make it relevant to my channel, I will be reimagining three of the main Zora characters as Hylians. I will be tackling Mipha, Sidon, and Yona, and how I think their Zora designs would translate into Hylian form. After all, we fish folk have to stick together. So without further ado, let's dive right into it. Starting off with Mipha, there is a lot to talk about, babes. So, Mipha was the oldest of the Zora royal siblings and the champion of the Zora chosen by Princess Zelda during the events of Breath of the Wild. The Zora are an aquatic tribe of humanoids possessing fish and amphibian-like traits who reside in the Lanaryu region in the land of Hyrule. Most Zora in Breath of the Wild have some sort of water-related ability, including water purification, incredible swimming speed, underwater breathing, and being able to swim up waterfalls. Mipha was the pilot of the divine beast Varuta and had incredible healing powers which have saved my life plenty of times while playing Breath of the Wild. Unfortunately, after being trapped inside the very divine beast she piloted, Mipha fell in battle against Waterblight Ganon. Her loss was grieved by the entire Zora's domain, but most of all by her little brother Sidon. Mipha is a very gentle, caring, soft-spoken, and kind character. She was a great warrior and older sister to Sidon. From speaking to characters like Muzu in Zora's Domain, we learn that Mipha was incredibly graceful in everything that she did. So for my design, I'd really like to capture that gentleness and grace that Mipha was emphasized to have. I mostly tried to capture that in her expression and stuck as closely to her original eye shape as best as I could. Mipha was a very dainty and delicate girl, so I tried to emulate that in my drawing to the best of my abilities. I don't know if I actually achieved that, so let me know in the comments. One thing that I find strange was never mentioned was just how small Mipha was. She's small by Hylian standards, and the Zora on average are all much taller than Hylians. Oh well, I just tried to capture her smallness as best as I could. I also tried to style her hair to match the likeness of her head fins, so for her fringes I went with a V shape similar to Mavis from Hotel Transylvania where the middle of her fringes are longer and they get shorter towards the sides of her face. 
I tried to mimic the side fins with sharply cropped side strands that frame her face, which also help make her face look smaller. I ended up making these side strands longer later to match the length, but for now, just stick with it, okay? As an extra touch, I also decided to add some face paint to help accentuate the shape of her original face fin, and because you can also see a bit of red on the white parts of their faces originally, and just for the whimsy. For the rest of her hair, I had the ingenious idea of styling it into a fishtail braid. I don't think any further explanation is required. Now, the hardest part of this entire design was definitely replicating all the delicate metal accessories that Mifa wears, but to make it easier for myself, I basically just used extra thick lines to block out the shapes, which I will then shade to carve out their details. Because I was doing this for a while, I began learning the patterns that appeared a lot in the Zora's metal work. They tend to incorporate a lot of crescent moons and swooping arched lines that flow elegantly, and this carries over to the rest of the domain and their weapons as well. I think this gracefulness in design is the reason why out of the four domains in Hyrule, Zora's domain is definitely my favorite. I was able to add new pieces to the outfit that I think fit perfectly with the rest of the design, including giving Mifa a set of gills. It was definitely a labor of love, but it was worth it in the end. Now we finally get to the actual attire. I had the idea of having them wear very delicate, flowy fabrics to represent their element, but I didn't want to stray too far away from Mifa's original silhouette. It becomes much more prominent with Sidon and Yona later on, but their metal accessories are definitely coded to a certain style of dress, which reminds me a lot of the Prince Charming from Cinderella. I'm not sure what the style is called, maybe Bridgerton, but that's kind of the vibe I get from the Zora's fashion sense. However, I didn't want to fully commit to that style because it doesn't really work as swimwear, and I didn't want to lose that connection they have to water. The Zora's attire in general is meant to mimic royal coats and attire worn by Hyrulean nobility while still being practical as swimwear, so I just let the metal work speak for themselves and made the fabrics similar to wetsuits. I think this works well because it matches the Zora armor, which is pretty much just a wetsuit with metal plates. I drew the suit to stick as closely to their fin design and coloration as best as I could, and added extra knee padding that was inspired by the Zora shield to make sure that the legs aren't too bare. And that's pretty much the design. So while I shade and color, let's talk about something I've always wanted to speak on. My theories on Mifa and Link's relationship and their history with each other. A lot of people consider Link and Mifa to be formally engaged because she created the Zora armor for him, which is a plot-relevant armor that lets you swim up waterfalls. And in Zora culture, that armor is the equivalent of an engagement ring, strongly indicating some sort of romantic tie between Mifa and Link. I also find it cute that it's a long-running theme that every Link incarnation has always had a love interest character who is a redhead whose name starts with the letter M. For example, Malon, Midna, Marin, and now Mifa. Now, if you follow me on any of my social media, you would know that I am a Zelda x Link shipper for life, and I ship every Link incarnation with his Zelda because I am of the belief that The Legend of Zelda is just a soulmate slash reincarnation story, and you cannot at me on this because all my extensive learning of the lore is to justify this belief. So because of that, do take my interpretation of Mifa and Link's relationship with a grain of salt, because Link did lose a majority of his memories, and there's a lot of leeway for more to have happened between them. And I'm also very biased, <laughs> so... Although I do feel like I need to say that I do like Mifa. I think she's a very well-designed character, and I actually relate to her a lot. I love what a great sister she was to Sidon, and their relationship was very beautiful. 
But with that out of the way, here is what I know about Mephi and Link's history and relationship based off of my own research and obsessive playthrough of Breath of the Wild. So, Mipha has known Link ever since he was a small boy, as indicated in Memory 10. I think since Link's father was also a knight, he might have traveled a lot and at some point was stationed in Zora's domain where Link would have met Mipha. That part is speculation of course, and this next bit might be shaky as well because it comes from Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, which is a spin-off game by Koei Tecmo in association with Nintendo of America, and is not technically canon because it's an alternate reality that involves time travel. But in that game, we do get more scenes with Mipha and Link, particularly their reunion after Link has been made Zelda's appointed knight. In that cutscene, Mipha mentions that Link has grown up a lot since the last time she saw him, which strongly implies that they haven't really seen each other since he was a kid, and probably because Link moved to Castletown to train as a knight following his father's footsteps. I also love how Mipha's dialogue in The Breath of the Wild Memory confirms that Link has always been a chaotic feral gremlin ever since he was a child. This is my Z-Link brain talking, but I love how Zelda was the only person capable of making Link clean up his act. He's so well behaved around her! And then as soon as she disappears, the man instantly regresses to his true feral nature. But anyway. Where, where am I going with this? Well, I think Mipha started developing feelings for Link after he had grown up, but ultimately never got to spend much time together with him because of his knightly duties and her own duties as the Princess of the Zora, so she was probably pining after him from afar. This is strongly supported by her dialogue saying how after this calamity business was over, she wanted to spend more time with him like they used to when they were young. And considering Link was only 17 in that cutscene, she must have meant the times when he was a young kid, and I refuse to entertain the thought that anything intimate happened between them in that time frame because when Link was a kid, Mipha still would have been a young adult because the Zora aged very slowly and it's just weird. It's creepy, okay? But from all the theory videos and essays I've seen about them, most pretty much have the conclusion that Link and Mipha were in a relationship, in love, and preparing to get married. But I have a different takeaway and no it's not just because I'm biased, I have evidence. My perception has always been that Mipha wanted to make her feelings known to Link and planned to profess her love to him with the Zora armor, but ultimately never got the opportunity to. It just doesn't seem like their relationship has fully developed yet, and Mipha was only just beginning to take the steps to get closer to Link. Why? Well, because this isn't how you act around your lover of several years that you're planning a wedding with. And this memory is canon because it was part of the Champion's Ballad DLC in the Breath of the Wild game. It just seems more like how you'd act around your crush. Plus, we are always hearing about how Mipha wants to train with Daruk to get stronger while looking at Link longingly, presumably so she can be closer to him, which implies that they're not very close now, you know? In my personal opinion, it's more likely that Link never knew about Mipha's romantic feelings for him because he'd known her since he was a child and probably didn't think she saw him that way. Plus, he was probably too busy with his duties to consider a relationship anyway, and by the end, it was too late for her anyway. So yeah, either way, sorry to all the Mifflink shippers out there. I respect you for your perseverance and pain tolerance, but aside from that, I do wish we saw more of Mipha outside of her crush on Link, because she's a great character and I would have loved to see how she was as a princess to the Zora and just how well she got along with the other champions. Overall though, I think she was a great addition to Breath of the Wild.
But first, I would like to thank today's sponsor, Tokyo Treat and Sakurako. My family and I always look forward to when these boxes get delivered to us every month because they're always full of delicious, super unique and high quality snacks that we wouldn't be able to try unless we lived in Japan. With Tokyo Treat, you will get up to 20 of the latest, most exclusive, limited edition and seasonal flavored Japanese snacks that are only available in Japan. And with Sakurako, each box comes with 20 traditional, authentic and artisan Japanese snacks including Japanese teas and a special Japanese tableware that will support local Japanese snack makers. There's a new theme every month, so you're always getting something new and exciting. This month, Tokyo Treat's theme is Osaka Snackation. Osaka is known as Japan's culinary capital, and this month's snacks capture Osaka's fun and exciting eats like the chocolate orange Kit Kats, Kobe melon soda, and the okonomiyaki senbei. Meanwhile, Sakurako's theme is mochi and fruit marvels. Mochi and fruit are two delicacies that hold a special place in the hearts of many Japanese people. This month, Sakurako invites you to experience their specially curated treats and tea like the strawberry mochi manju, shine muscat jelly, and the peach kibidango that pair excellently with the genmaicha green tea. You can also enjoy them with this month's special tableware item, the chrysanthemum dish. The boxes also come with a booklet that explains every snack included in the box, including any allergen information in case you have any dietary restrictions. You can also learn about Japanese culture. If you're interested in getting your own boxes or as a gift for friends and family, check out the links in my description. Thank you again to Sakurako and Tokyo Treat for sponsoring my video. Next up, we have Sidon. If you're watching this video, you probably know all about him. He's arguably one of the most popular characters to come out of Breath of the Wild for very obvious reasons, and you know, I'm not judging. I get it. He's a cheerful and supportive guy. He's incredibly selfless, noble, and cares deeply about the people around him. In Tears of the Kingdom, we also get to learn more about how the loss of his sister affected his relationships with other people, especially the ones he loves, and how terrified he is of losing them the same way he lost Mipha. In other words, he's got a tragic past and a jawline that's sharper than the Master Sword itself, plus washboard abs. What more could you need? The developers did a really good job of conveying handsomeness through his design. It felt almost purposeful. So it was very important that I carry that handsomeness over in his Hylian form as well. But at the same time, I also perceive him as a silly dorky guy and he makes me laugh whenever I see him running around with his stubby little legs. From the get-go, I wanted to have him in his signature pose even though I did feel a bit conflicted about it. It would obscure a lot of his front part and make it difficult to really see the extent of his design, but he wouldn't really be side on if he wasn't doing that dorky ass pose, so I decided to commit to it and there was no going back now. Whereas Mifa's design felt smoother and dolphin inspired, Sidon is very sharp and clearly based on a hammerhead shark. His eyes are sharper and his smile is sharper too. Literally, Sidon just wouldn't be Sidon without that big, dorky grin of his. I tried to capture that signature hammerhead shape as best as I could with his hair, and of course, like Mifa, I also styled his hair in a fishtail braid. For his outfit, I decided to go with his new Tears of the Kingdom look because I love the new additions to his outfit, like the flared collar and gloves. Spoiler alert! But Sidon also becomes king of the Zora by the end of the regional phenomena quest in Lanaryu and rises to the crown. The design is great, but <laughs> replicating it was definitely an endeavor, I'll tell you that much. I tackled it with the same strategy as Mifa's accessories, mostly blocking out the shapes first and defining later. While drawing, I also just noticed that Sidon has a whistle as part of his chest crest. It's so funny. Is he also a part-time coach for the local Zora sports team? It wouldn't be out of character for him. 
But getting back to his outfit, Sidon just feels like the kind of guy to be shirtless or have his shirt completely unbuttoned at every opportunity. So I think it's only right that he be bare chested like the lovable dumb ho he is. He'll also falls right in line with the styles of other non Hyrulean royalty and helps distinguish them more from the Hyrule royal family. I imagine his suit is connected with his chest piece and is more of an open front vest than a full coat. However, it extends down past his waist to flare out in that signature Zora fin shape for his coattails. For the bottoms, I use the same design for Mipha's greaves because Sidon has a similar coloration, the only difference being the placement of the red dot on their legs. Whereas Mipha has one dot above each knee, Sidon has two on the outside of his lower legs. I wasn't sure if I wanted to add the front drapes for his greaves, but to keep the look consistent, I ended up adding them anyway. Overall, I think I managed to make Sidon look regal and sophisticated without straying too far away from their aquatic lifestyle. Honestly, after figuring out how I wanted their attire to look with Mipha, the process went by so much faster. And while I color and shade things in, let's talk about the current tizzy centered around Sidon. So if you are in the Breath of the Wild fandom, and I say Breath of the Wild fandom specifically instead of the general Zelda fandom because for a lot of people, including myself, Breath of the Wild was their first Zelda game ever, and probably the only Zelda game they care about. So it is very different of a fandom from the fans who started with the classic Zelda games like Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. But basically, you would know that Sidon is very famously paired up with Link. Sid Link, as the ship is called. I would argue it's probably one of the most prominent romantic pairings for Link in Breath of the Wild, second to only Zelda and Link themselves. But also, I spend most of my time on Twitter and Tumblr and AO3, three of the most notoriously pro-LGBTQ plus websites in existence, so my perspective may be skewed. But the point still stands that a lot of people I've seen consider both Sidon and Link gay and are deeply in love with each other. If they didn't just ship Sidon with themselves, which honestly, I respect you if you did that. So of course, when Tears of the Kingdom dropped and people rushed to Zora's domain to see what Sidon has been up to since the last game, people were shocked and appalled to discover that Sidon is engaged to another woman. And not only that, but that Link had completely ghosted Sidon after restoring the Divine Beasts and defeating Ganon. They did not take it well at all, besties. And the cope manifested in different ways. Most of it became hate to the new character introduced as Sidon's fiance, while others pretty much ignore the in-game interactions and dialogue and still consider Sidon's relationship with said new character, Yona, to be purely political and that there is no real love between them because Link is Sidon's true love. And honestly, that's the kind of cope I would have as well. <laughs> I've even seen people say how Yona is more like a sister to Sidon, which is even weirder and more uncomfy because he's marrying her and going to produce heirs with her? What in the sweet home Alabama is this? <laughs> The political marriage angle I can still get behind, but him viewing Yona as a sister is just... no. <laughs> and also, this might be a hot take, but those people are just wrong. I'm sorry, but Sidon and Yona clearly adore each other and are super supportive of each other. Every line of dialogue they have with each other always includes some sort of pet name. Their interactions are so sweet that it's sickening. And Sidon even refused to go with Link to stop the falling sludge because he didn't want to leave Yona alone. Because he's scared that something would happen to her if he's not there to help. This is the first time we see Sidon hesitate from springing into action and running headfirst into danger. Because he has something, or someone, that he doesn't want to leave behind. And 
if that's not an indication that he truly loves Yona, I don't know what is. And I'm not saying Sidon doesn't care about Link. Clearly he does. He considers Link his best friend, and there's a freaking statue of his and Link's adventure in Breath of the Wild where Mifa's statue used to be. But I personally think this is a bit one-sided. Of course Sidon would consider Link his best friend for saving his kingdom and helping him find peace with losing his sister, but Link has literally never once come to see Sidon after their first adventure together, according to Sidon's own dialogue, the first time we see him in Tears of the Kingdom. I was actually kind of surprised because I thought that Link would have visited a lot, if not at the very least to accompany Zelda. I personally can't see their relationship as romantic because Sidon was very, very young when he knew Link. And even now, he still views Link like a personal hero, which is a terrible decision, really. Nobody should model themselves after Link. And he looks up to him like a cool older brother. And after Mifa was gone, Link was probably the only older sibling figure he had left. You can ship whatever you want, of course, but I'm of the opinion that if you really believe in a ship and think it's the best relationship for a character, you don't need to put down other characters or other ships to enjoy it. We can all agree to disagree and not be petty, immature children. Unless you are a child, at which point you can be as stupid as you want, but you know, fuck around and find out. If you're free to be nasty on the internet, people are just as free to be nasty back to you. But hopefully it facilitates some character development. But since we're on the topic of character pairings and the uproar surrounding Sidon, why don't we get to the root of the issue herself, eh? Yona is a new Zora character introduced in Tears of the Kingdom, and very recently she was trending like crazy on Twitter for the wave of hate she was receiving. Man, this character was being bashed left and right, being body shamed and getting called every single name in the book. It was kind of nuts. And it's not even for any serious reason. She's not a bad character. She just took Sidon away from his fangirls. Yuna is actually, in a way, a lot like Mifa. She's very kind and caring, and from her and Sidon's interactions, you can clearly see that they are each other's biggest cheerleaders. She cares about Sidon more than anything and is very familiar with how he thinks and is empathetic to what he's going through. She's confident, smart, self-assured, and she has a cool head. She helps Sidon keep his head on straight and gives him the security he needs to be himself. Plus, she clearly holds all the brain cells in that relationship, and we love that for them. Well, at least I do. Even though we've only just been introduced to her, you can tell that there's a lot of rapport between Yona and Sidon, and she clearly seems to know him well. I find it really sweet how Sidon really values her input, and I can already see them being that couple where when they have kids and they want to do something, they'd ask Sidon and he'd go, what did your mother say? There's a lot of respect and healing in that relationship. In a way, it's kind of like Sidon has found his own Zelda. You can probably tell that I really love Yona. Sure, some people have gripes with her design and think she's not that pretty or pretty enough to be with Sidon, but I personally really like it. Aside from Muzu, she's the only character in Zora's domain to be based on a manta ray instead of a shark. I love her squishy little face and puppy mouth, and I really like how her fins are longer than the other Zoras. Those were some features I really wanted to carry over into her Hylian design. I tried to draw Yona with chubby little cheeks as per her original design, which I think is a great contrast to the sharp angular features of Sidon. It doesn't look the best now, but I do try to readjust it later on, and I'm quite happy with the final look. Unlike the other Zoras as well, Yona doesn't have the V-shaped head fin on her face. 
Instead, she has a flat shape across her forehead, which to me just translated to blunt fringes, and I freaking love that. You guys know I'm a huge fan of blunt fringes. I shaped her side fringes to match the shape of her ray fins and for her tail, I decided to do a regular braid as opposed to a fish tail to mimic the thinness of her tail. For some reason, it gave me a lot of trouble though. I really had to fight with her braid to get it to look right, but I think I got there in the end. After drawing Sidon's extremely complicated jewelry, Yona's was a piece of cake by comparison. I think her accessories make her look really noble and refined, just like Sidon. The ascot and jewel brooch combination reminds me a lot of Violet Evergarden and... Huh, this entire look is feeling a lot like a dead ringer for Violet. Oh well, at least this relationship doesn't have an uncomfortable age gap and massive power imbalance. But on the topic of her accessories, another unique thing about Yona as well is that she is the only Zora to wear gold instead of silver. I'm not sure why this might be aside from just a color palette thing, but I personally have the headcanon that Yona probably came from a different Zora tribe, likely from out of Hyrule because we don't see any other Zora tribes in the land. And I think this because of the small variations in her appearance compared to the rest of the Zora in Lanaryu. So I wanted to really highlight those differences. Because her fins are longer than Mipha and Sidon's, I wanted to reflect that in her attire as well. I translated this as her having longer sleeves and flowy fabrics as opposed to tassels like in Sidon and Mipha's design. I think this makes her look really sophisticated and matronly, which suits her title of Zora Caretaker. And it's honestly just a nice contrast to the other Zoras in the domain. Yona coming from outside of Hyrule would also explain why we've never seen her before. Of course, that is just a headcanon and there's nothing in the game itself that explains where Yona came from. For all we know, maybe we're just expected to believe that she's been in Zora's domain the entire time. But then, all the Sheikah shrines and towers and the divine beasts and Sheikah slate have been completely erased from Tears of the Kingdom and that never got addressed either, so... I am pretty curious if Yona is an already existing Zora NPC that just got a redesign though. It's unlikely, because someone definitely would have pointed that out by now, but I might just have to boot up Breath of the Wild again and check, because that is a pretty valid gripe to have with Yona otherwise. A lot of people have said that Yona came out of nowhere and her appearance was too abrupt for someone as significant as Sidon's childhood friend and fiancé because we've never heard mention or hints of her at all in Breath of the Wild. I agree that it would have been better if they hinted at Yona in Breath of the Wild, but here is my counter-argument. Link just isn't in Sidon's life much and doesn't know that much about him. The only time Link showed up in Sidon's life again was during times of crisis for the both of them. Zora's domain was plagued by never-ending rainfall thanks to Varuta, and Link was in the process of defeating Calamity Ganon. Plus, the entire domain was still grieving Mipha, so a childhood best friend of Sidon's, from another tribe at that, hypothetically, probably wouldn't be the biggest concern for people. And it's also entirely possible that there wasn't anything worth mentioning between Sidon and Yona during Breath of the Wild, since evidently he was trying to find closure from losing Mipha and couldn't move on with his life until then. Sidon doesn't have any journal entries we can read to get to know him better either. And when it was over, Link just never came back to see him again. From every article I've seen about how long after the first game Tears of the Kingdom is set, there's a consensus that Tears of the Kingdom begins at least three to five years after Breath of the Wild, judging by how much the kid characters in the game have grown. And a lot can happen in three to five years. Sidon could have reconnected with an old childhood friend, grew close to her, and fell in love. Of course, Sidon being the only heir to the throne would need to marry and have kids to continue the royal Zora bloodline regardless, so it was inevitable that he would find a queen to do that with. And as I've said before, I really disagree that their marriage is purely political with no feelings involved. In fact, I think Sidon knows that he's very lucky to be able to marry someone who is not a complete stranger, who clearly cares a lot about him and his kingdom. After all, 
Her title is literally Zora Caretaker. And from what we've seen of their rapport in the game and how they collaborate with one another, I think they'll be excellent rulers together. Also, do people just forget that if it wasn't for Yona, Sidon wouldn't have gone with Link to the Water Temple and fulfilled his destiny of becoming the Water Sage? Heck, Yona was able to immediately identify what was going on with Sidon and why he was acting so unlike himself. Girl knows him like the back of her hand and he clearly adores that about her. Yes, this is officially a Yona fan page now. I'm digging my heels in and dying on this hill. But anyway, that's it for me. If you made it this far, let me know what you think of my Hylian designs for the Zora Royals. Thank you so much for hanging out with me in the pond for a while. I hope your skin didn't get too pruney. Big shout out to my lovely pond dwellers on Patreon. If you want to become a pond dweller and get early access to my content, join my Patreon. If you want to see more from me, then please follow me on all of my social media. If you want to submit fan art or chat with me, join my Discord server. And if you want more of my stories, check out my Wild Word series here on YouTube because that will make me really happy. All the links are in my description and I will see you all in the next video. Goodbye!